I speak to you now in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Merry Christmas. Christmas. Alright, so for many people in our country, Christmas has come and gone. It's all in the past tense. But the reality of our faith is that we are still on this last day in the Christmas season. It is literally the twelfth day of Christmas. There should be lords a-leaping and swans a-swimming right outside the door. But because we are in this particular moment, right on the cusp of Epiphany, we have a few different things happening today. Uh, First, this is our first day where we've gone to our new service schedule at 8 o'clock and at 10. By the way, are you, anybody that's a member of the, the vestry, raise your hand. Okay, so you need to look around. Apparently, if you offer chili after the service, this is the kind of turnout you get. So keep that in mind in August. Nice hot bowl of chili. But this evening, we will gather also as a convocation at the Church of the Epiphany downtown. And we will celebrate the Epiphany Liturgy. Now today, we also had the option to actually use the, uh, the reading from Matthew and the arrival of the kings. And I thought it was, it was beautifully done. The, 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 it's not an intro. What was it called again, Mark? That, that (laughs) was beautiful. Uh, Apparently, some member of the congregation actually has small treasure chest filled with gold. Uh, I'm assuming the other two have frankincense and myrrh in them. Uh, And we had our our three of our children that presented that that image to us. Now, if you were here at Christmas, and particularly if you were here for the pageant, you saw us reproduce. The, uh, the, the events of the birth of Christ from Luke, the nativity. But, again, because Epiphany is only just now approaching, uh, as we understand our fate, the kings have not yet arrived. In fact, in some homes, you'll have your nativity scene, your nativity set, your creche, and the kings will be somewhere else. I've known families that kept them upstairs and slowly sort of marched them closer and closer and closer to the nativity scene until today they would have been poised, just poised, about to to enter into the scene. In fact, if you step out into our hallway at the earlier service, we had the kings sort of across the hall from, uh, from Mary and the baby. We do this to commemorate a moment to speak to an expression of the story that we find only in Matthew. The four Gospels all have a different version of this time. In fact, the Gospel according to John, it actually begins at creation, and then it leaps forward to the baptism. There is no mention of the childhood, the birth of Christ. The Gospel according to Mark, the Gospel according to Mark, it has its beginning at the baptism with no mention of the birth of Christ. Luke, we have it from the perspective of the story as it's revealed to Mary. And it's because of Luke that we have essentially all all of this, that we gather to celebrate the birth of that child in the way that we do when we read the story from Luke on Christmas. But Matthew, Matthew does something else. We are presented with the wise men. The wise men. The magi as we identify them. Now we don't know where the magi might have come from. Uh, Wise men from the east. Well, that might be Babylon, which is about... 500 miles as the crow flies from Bethlehem. It might be from the Arabian coast, which is about 13, 1400 miles. But it's not actually the distance that would have taken these people so long to arrive. Believe it or not, it's because they were people 
men, apparently, of learning. Magi. Magi. That's actually from a, a Greek word, magos, that we get the word magic from. But, if you have a, a smattering of ancient Persian, we got any ancient Persian speakers in here? <laughs> Magupati, I probably didn't pronounce that correctly. But that's actually uh, an even older term from ancient Persian that refers to the priesthood of the Zoroastrians an entirely different faith outside of Judaism or the worship of the Greek gods, the Roman gods, an entirely different faith. And it's our assumption that that was perhaps the fate of the Magi. But not just being wise and learned men, if you were a Zoroastrian, that meant that you probably also were involved in the study of astrology and astronomy. The two ideas were really part of a single whole at the time. And while I do hope no one here takes astrology seriously, the fact is the, the wise men, the, the learned men of the time, would have seen it as, as a science, that they learned so much from the movement of the stars, the planets, the moon. Think about it. In any agrarian society, you know something about planting cycles and harvesting cycles, all based on the seasons as you understand them from the stars and from the moon. The season changes, the stars in the sky move, the moon changes. It's a way of determining what is to come next. So it makes sense that they would have been looking for things that are happening next using those methods. And so these learned wise men come to Jerusalem. Now the wise men represent a number of things. They represent authority. They represent wisdom. They represent power and riches. But it's interesting who they come to. They come to Herod in his palace in Jerusalem. They come to the king. And they ask him, because of the signs that we have seen in the sky, we understand that the actual king of the Jews has been born, and we have come to pay him homage. Homage. We're going to honor him. We're going to present him with gifts. Now, Herod, as king of the Jews, his first responsibility, according to Torah, is to read Torah. In fact, if you go back to those first five books of the Bible, what you find is the king, when he is not out in the field leading his army, is supposed to be sitting on his throne studying the Word of God so that the king can be a better ruler of the people. So that the king can be both just and merciful and fair. In other words, the king is supposed to be an expert on the story. He's supposed to know exactly what it says so that he can then act on it among his people. Now I said that the wise men, of course, represent a number of things. First and foremost, perhaps, knowledge, wisdom. But that's supposed to be something the king is all about as well. But it's not. The king instead represents that thing which unfortunately those in authority too often assume is all their purpose. And that's power. That's power. Do you know why Herod was king? Herod was king because he had supported the winning side in the Roman Civil War 40 years earlier. He had supported Octavius, who would become Augustus Caesar, over Antony and Cleopatra. And for that, he was rewarded. That's just pure history. That's just the way it was. He was rewarded 
for supporting the winning side in a civil war. That's who Herod is. Herod wields power. And he is brutal and he is ruthless. That too is history. Which means he is not what Torah says a king is supposed to be. So he doesn't know why these wise men have come. He doesn't know where they're supposed to go because he doesn't actually know the story of the faith that he is supposed to be all about. He doesn't know the story of the faith of his people. And when he finds out what that story says, he wants to do something about it. He doesn't want to worship the child. He wasn't want, doesn't want to pay homage. He's not going to show up with a fourth gift. Instead, his response leads to something that we actually don't have in the text this morning, something called the slaughter of the innocent. The slaughter of the innocents. That kind of response from Herod is also just history. Herod ordered the execution of his own children. His own children because he was afraid that one or two of them would usurp power. He ordered mass executions because he was concerned not with faith, not with justice, not with mercy. He was concerned with power. And Herod knew how to wield power. But that also means that our story is not about that kind of power at all. We have the example, the model of Herod about what is wrong, about what's not to be about what faith is not supposed to be like. And then we have the example, not just of Jesus, but of these wise people that have come to see the child. It's perhaps two years since the birth of the baby, which is why, by the way, the slaughter of the innocents, Herod orders every child two and under to be put to the sword. The wise men are not Jews. The wise men are not representatives of the faith practiced by the people of Israel. They are representatives of the other, of something different, of a completely different understanding, by the way, of God. And yet, not only do they get it, they are a crucial part of the story. And that's also something else we find in Matthew. I told you where the other Gospels begin the story. Matthew doesn't begin the story with the arrival of the wise men. Matthew begins the story with the genealogy of Jesus. From Abraham to David, and from David to Joseph. And when you read that genealogy, it's a little bit surprising. Because the names that are linked to Jesus include names that we good fine Christians would be too embarrassed to include in our own family tree. Prostitutes, thieves, murderers, evil kings. From Tamar to Boaz to Bathsheba to Ahaz. All of these different people that are clearly just not the kind of folks you're going to invite to the chili lunch that we're having here. And yet, these are the men and women that are attached to the line of Jesus. Because apparently, we are all a part of the story. Good, bad, or even indifferent, this story 
is our story. And it doesn't matter what anybody else may think about them or you or me. We are a part of the line of Jesus. Every single one of us. By the way, if you think that you are unworthy, if you think that you have failed and fallen short, if you think that you are the absolute paragon of brokenness and sin, well, maybe you are. <laughs> but guess what? It's okay. Because you're still one of those beloved folks accepted and embraced by Christ. On the other hand, if you're a little bit full of yourself, okay? If you're a little bit proud of yourself, if you're a little bit kind of filled with your own righteousness, well, it's got some of those people in the genealogy too. It's got David who was a arrogant son of a gun, which is how you end up having your general murdered so you can have his wife. Guess what? You're a part of the story and the family too. So if you get nothing else from this sermon, then hear this. We talk a lot about accepting Christ. You hear that from lots of different preachers. Accept Christ. Accept Christ. Claim Jesus as your own. But the truth of Holy Scripture is this. That whether you do that or not, whether you claim Christ or not, Jesus has already claimed you.